world news tonight. The race is on. Bangladesh government gives in to public outrage with announcement of parliamentary elections. Hope on the horizon. The US and China strive promising deals alongside the APEC summit. Potential surrender? Myanmar's junta portrayed in a pathetic position following relentless insurgent onslaughts. Historic tribute. UK royals immortalize the legacies of the late majesties Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip with artistic sculptures. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and thank you for joining us for World News. We begin tonight's broadcast in Bangladesh as the country made a major election announcement. The national poll body of Bangladesh stated that paramilitary elections will be held on the 7th of January, an elevation that sparked immediate threats of boycott from the opposition, which fears the elections will be rigged. The main opposition Bangladesh Nationalist Party, whose top leaders are either jailed or in exile, has already said that it will boycott the polls if Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina does not resign and transfer power to a non-partisan caretaker government to oversee the general election. Hasina has led Bangladesh for the past 15 years and has been accused of ruling with an iron fist. She is seen as almost certain to return to power for a fourth time if the opposition boycott goes ahead. Hasina's main rival and two-time premier BNP leader Khaled Azir is effectively under house arrest for what her party calls trumped-up corruption charges. The BMP boycotted the 2014 elections but participated in 2018. Jamaat-e Aslimi, the largest Islamist party in the Muslim-majority country, and the Islami Andalon Bangladesh party also said that they would spurn the polls. Mass anti-government demonstrations and a widening crackdown on the opposition have been simmering for months and intensified over recent weeks. Hasina has been accused of authoritarianism, human rights violations, a crackdown on free speech and suppression of dissent while jailing her critics. The government is under pressure from Western countries to hold free and fair elections. The United States, the top buyer of Bangladeshi garments, said in May that it was implementing a policy allowing for restriction of visas to Bangladeshis who undermine the democratic election process in the country of nearly 170 million people. Last week, up to 25,000 garment workers clashed with police as protests rejecting a government offered pay rise forced the closure of at least 100 factories outside the capital, Dhaka. An update on the escalating Myanmar revolt. Myanmar's junta has reported heavy assaults by insurgents and has asked government staff to get ready for emergencies. Myanmar's military has battled ethnic minorities and other insurgencies for decades, but a 2021 coup has brought up unprecedented coordination between anti-military forces that are mounting the biggest challenge to the army in years. Junta spokesperson Zhao Minchun said the military was facing heavy assaults from a significant number of armed rebel soldiers in Shan State in the northeast, Kaya State in the east and Rakhine State in the west, and that some military positions had been evacuated and the insurgents had been using drones to drop hundreds of bombs on military. Reports. It was also said the junta is urgently taking measures to protect against these drone bomb attacks effectively. According to Tim Mongsui, secretary of the Napiatao Council in the capital, government staff have been ordered to form units to respond to emergency situations. He denied that the order was in response to the security situation, saying the capital was calm. A parallel government formed by pro-democracy politicians to oppose the military and allied with some insurgent factions has launched a Road to Naipetao campaign which it says is aimed at taking control of the capital. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has expressed his deep concern over the escalating conflict in Myanmar. According to the UN, the number of people displaced by the fighting has reached 2 million and the Secretary General appealed to all sides to protect non-combatants and open access for humanitarian aid. Volunteer People's Defence Forces, the militias formed by local activists after the suppression of peaceful protests back in 2021, have launched their own attacks to take advantage of the military setbacks in Shan State and keep up the pressure on the ruling junta. PDFs, or People's Defence Forces, are less experienced and more poorly armed than the established ethnic armies, but their capabilities are improving and they often ally themselves with the more experienced ethnic soldiers who have been fighting the central government for decades. 
Ethnic insurgents dominate their own state and recently captured the border town of Rikhaldar. And in a significant upheaval, the junta has also lost control of much of the border with India. Now on to the high-stakes meeting on the sidelines of the APEC summit. U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping agreed to resume military communications and cooperate on an anti-drug crackdown. This as both leaders agreed on the need to stabilize relations. Leaders of the U.S. and China met face-to-face -face for the first time in about a year in San Francisco on Wednesday and agreed to resume military communication and take steps to curb production of fentanyl, a leading cause of drug overdoses in the U.S. This comes after Beijing cut off military-to-military -military communications with Washington last year, after then U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. Relations between the two countries escalated further in February, when the U.S. shot down a suspected Chinese spy balloon that flew over its territory. After the meeting that went on for about four hours, a senior U.S. official reportedly explained that Biden requested that both countries institutionalize military-to-military -military dialogue. The same official also explained that China will go directly after specific chemical companies that make fentanyl precursors. After recent months of heightened tensions between U.S. and China, Biden and Xi also made clear that they want to stabilize the relationship between the two countries. We have to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. And we also have to manage it responsibly, that competition. The Chinese president also said turning their back on each other is not an option for two large countries like the U.S. and China. It is unrealistic for one side to remodel the other and conflict and confrontation have unbearable consequences for both sides. As for the issue of Taiwan, Xi reportedly told Biden that China has no plans for military action against Taiwan in the coming years, but did lay out conditions where the use of force could be used. In response, Biden asked China to respect Taiwan's electoral process. Latest updates on the road to the White House now. There's finally a date for the New Hampshire 2024 presidential primaries, which is set on the 23rd of January. The long-awaited announcement from Secretary of State David Scanlon confirms and firms up Republicans' dominating calendar and officially puts the state out of compliance with National Democrats' preferred voting order. Based on the GOP calendar, January 23rd was the date widely expected. It's just over a week after Iowa's January 15th caucuses, enough time for New Hampshire to bask in the flood of post-Iowa campaigning. And it's more than a week before South Carolina's Democratic primary on the 3rd of February, keeping in line with New Hampshire law that requires the Granite State hold its primary a week before any similar contest. President Joe Biden and top Democrats wanted South Carolina, a more diverse state that propelled Biden to the nominations in 2020, in the lead-off spot for their 2024 calendar. New Hampshire was supposed to vote second on a shared date with Nevada. But Scanlon and other Republicans who control state government long said they wouldn't bend to Democrats' demand. Australia's government said that it would introduce legislation to allow ankle bracelets, curfews and other rules to monitor dozens of foreigners with criminal records after a court released them from indefinite immigration detention. In Western Sydney, this hotel promises modern rooms, four stars and a new life for this man. Detention centre life is totally like a jail life, that's not good for, for refugee people. He says he's not a criminal, although admits some of the 84 freed by the High Court are, and many now with friends or family far from the high fences they knew. The High Court corrected that last week and now the executive is just trying again and the Australian public should be incredibly wary. But in the capital... I move that this bill now be read a second time. 
New legislation imposing new restrictions on the former detainees, including ankle monitoring bracelets, stricter curfews, visa holders will also be prevented from going near schools or childcare facilities, and breaches of restrictions are now a crime, punishable by up to five years in prison. We did not want to let these people out of detention, but we have a simple message for them. We will set the strictest possible conditions for you. If you, if you do not follow them, you will end up back in jail. The opposition supports the laws but point out the lags. It is the absolute bare minimum required to deal with this problem. So was legislation drafted in June? No. no. Was it drafted in July? No. Was it drafted in August? No. Was it drafted in September, October? No. It wasn't even drafted 24 hours ago. This parliament is shadow boxing the High Court. Are you going to open up your house to them? How many are you going to invite into your home? How many are you going to look after? We'll be back with all more deals of this short commercial break. Welcome back. Germany's government has been plunged into crisis after a constitutional court blew a 60 billion euro hole in its net zero budget. Opposition parties predicted Olaf Scholz's three-party coalition will not survive after judges rule that it was illegal to repurpose unspent coronavirus emergency funds to fight climate change. The German government was dealt a big blow by a constitutional court on Wednesday. Its finances were stuck with a $65 billion hole after a court ruling on unused funds from the global health crisis. The decision forced authorities to freeze major spending pledges focused on green initiatives and industry support. It also threw this week's budget discussions into disarray for Chancellor Olaf Scholz's three-way coalition. The Constitutional Court's ruling, of course, has immediate consequences on the Climate and Transformation Fund, where the 60 billion euros which were planned are no longer available. That is why the budget plan will have to be discussed again, and it needs to be worked over. The country's coalition had agreed two years ago to transfer debts raised to help with the health crisis to a climate fund. The move allowed the parties to make the most of a temporary suspension of borrowing limits in the constitution. But the constitutional court ruled it was incompatible with the debt break enshrined in Germany's constitutional basic law and so was void. Finance Minister Christian Lindner now faces more questions over how he plans to keep spending in check. The German government respects this ruling. It creates clarity on the debt break. The ruling, however, has potentially large consequences on federal and state budgets. $65 billion was set aside for numerous initiatives like making buildings more energy efficient and subsidising chips production. One leading research group called the ruling a massive setback for the government and said further spending cuts now look unavoidable. Germany's budget for next year and financial plans through 2027 are due to be finalised on Friday. The UK's controversial plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda was ruled unlawful by the Supreme Court, dealing a potentially fatal blow to Prime Minister Rishi Shunak's flagship migration policy and sparking a furious revolt from the right wing of British politics. It's a major blow to British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. The country's top court has unanimously ruled the government's controversial plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda is illegal. Asking ourselves whether there were substantial grounds for believing that a real risk of reformment existed at the relevant time, we have concluded that there were. The Home Secretary's appeal is therefore dismissed. Wednesday's decision drew criticism over in Rwanda. This after the British Supreme Court cited Kigali's poor human rights record, enforced disappearances, as well as the practice of sending migrants back to countries of origin. Britain's Prime Minister too expressed regret. Has your plan failed, Prime Minister? The judgment confirms that the principle of removing asylum seekers to a safe third country is lawful. The government has already been working in advance on a new treaty with Rwanda, which we will finalise in light of today's judgment. 
The Prime Minister also suggested he'd be willing to change Britain's domestic legal framework or revisit international conventions if his revised Rwanda plan is held up by courts in the future. Critics, however, argue the government's approach is wrong. There is no evidence, the government doesn't point to any evidence, that deterrent policies like sending people to Rwanda actually impact uh, on the number of arrivals. The government's controversial policy was created under former Prime Minister Boris Johnson and was carried forward by Rishi Sunak. Wednesday's ruling comes a day after Sunak's former Home Secretary Suella Braverman hit out at the government for having no plan B if the Rwanda plan was deemed unlawful. Britain has so far spent £140 million on its policy without any migrants being sent to Rwanda. North Korea's human rights violations have been an ongoing issue for quite some time. And this year, a United Nations committee has reaffirmed the issue is still prevalent today. The forced repatriation of detectors in China was among the main reasons for the decision. The United Nations has passed a resolution on human rights in North Korea for the 19th year in a row. On Wednesday, local time, the third committee of the UN General Assembly convened in Washington to pass the resolution by consensus. This means that all member states have agreed to adopt the draft resolution without taking a vote, including South Korea, which co-sponsored the latest resolution. This year, European Union countries led the resolution which highlighted very serious concerns. Concerns over human rights in North Korea have been voiced in the General Assembly since 2005, and this year's resolution contains much of the same information as in previous years. A new addition to the resolution is the forcible repatriation of North Korean defectors in China, as the easing of COVID-19 border closures has made it easier for people to travel. According to the UN, this highlights the need for compliance with the Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, as refugees could be punished once back in North Korea. Another reason for this is because some countries, namely China, define North Korean defectors as illegal immigrants rather than refugees. This means that they are not protected by laws that ban forced repatriation. The resolution encourages the Security Council to hold Pyongyang accountable for its actions, with measures including referral to the International Criminal Court to put further sanctions on the country. In response, the North Korean ambassador to the UN condemned the resolution and reportedly criticized it as an anti-DPRK plot by the United States and called the accounts of forcible repatriation as fraudulent false testimonies. Other than forced repatriation, the resolution contained concerns over North Korea's development of nuclear weapons through violations of human rights such as forced labor, as well as the issue of South Korean prisoners of war and detainees. An international team of health experts said that heat-related illnesses and deaths are rising as the world warms, forecasting a 370% surge in yearly heat deaths by mid-century if the world warms by 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Words on this sign read Climate Refuge, a museum acting as a cool place to shelter from the heat, more of which could be desperately needed in the future. According to a report by over 100 researchers from international institutions, heat-related deaths could increase 4.7-fold by the middle of this century without global action on climate change. Heat-related mortality of adults over 65 years of age, a very vulnerable age group, have increased by 85% since the 90s alone. And we now know that more than half of that increase wouldn't have occurred if temperatures hadn't increased. So we know that it's climate change causing this. The 2023 report of the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change was published on Wednesday and outlines the imperative need for a health-centred response in a world facing irreversible harms. It states that in 2023, the world saw its highest global temperatures in over 100,000 years, and also that areas affected by extreme drought are growing, jeopardising water security, sanitation and food production. One of the solutions posed by this researcher is to consider how infrastructure and economies plan for rising temperatures. For example, the existence of terraces, green roofs, these work. Blue zones, parks with fountains and climatic shelters work. Therefore, things that are known to work at the local level should be applied. 
But first, he says the goal is to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. According to the report, 1,337 tonnes of carbon dioxide is still emitted every second, the consequences of which could be dire on our health systems. Welcome back. Spanish protesters clashed with the police in Madrid. For more on that story and more, let's take you on the world in a minute. Spanish protesters opposed to a government amnesty plan for Catalan separatists clashed with riot police in Madrid. Indonesia's Defence Minister Prabhava Subianto urged global powers to use their influence to call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Former Prime Minister David Cameron, who was named as Britain's new Foreign Minister, met President Vladimir Zelensky for talks and said in a video posted by Zelensky's office that he wanted to underscore London's support for Ukraine. Israeli emergency services said three suspected Palestinian assailants opened fire at a checkpoint on a main road between Jerusalem and the West Bank city of Bethlehem, wounding six people. Security forces opened fire at the assailants. The Iranian world got off to an early lead at the Rally Japan today, winning the shakedown stage. He came in an impressive 1.4 seconds ahead of Toyota's Elfin Evans with Sebastian O'Hare, also of Toyota. 1.6 seconds off of Hyundai shakedown win. That is all we have for you on World News tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight in London, UK, as statues of Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, were unveiled at the Royal Albert Hall, where this year's Royal British Legion Festival of Remembrance will be held. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.